Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. This is Fry Yay, as Jarrett Ransom likes to say. And we love Fridays because it's our special, special Ask and Answer episode with our friends over at Fundraising Academy, um, headquartered at National University. We're really fortunate because every Friday we get a different voice from Fundraising Academy. And they come in, uh, come on, and they answer questions that folks submit. And um, it's really, really cool. Muhi, right before we came on air, I got a question um, today that was asked. I mm -hmm. uh, didn't have a, get a chance to put it on um, our slides, but um, we'll... Curveball. We'll, yeah, it's like total curveball. Yeah. It's a question that's never been asked before. And so I'm really excited to um, try and a, remember it <laughs> and, <laughs> and then discuss it with you. So that'll be kind of fun. So as I said, we get, we're really fortunate to get somebody different every, every Friday. Today we have Muhi Kwaja coming to us from... Where are you today? Michigan. Michigan. Ooh, I also said the other M word. <laughs> Michigan. Okay. Michigan. Well, we are thrilled to have you. If you joined us on our um, green room chatter, we were talking with Mui about he's going to be coming in January to talk about his experience as the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be fascinating and I can't wait to learn uh, more from you, Muhi, about that because um, it's an amazing system we have. Speaking of systems, we have folks that have been with us from day one. We started now three years plus um, ago, and they include Bloom Bo Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part time controller, nonprofit thought leader, of course, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. If you have missed any of our 900 plus episodes, no problem. You can pull them up on our fabulous new app. You can find us on streaming or podcasts. My personal favorite movie is to speak into, um, you know, your smart remote and say the nonprofit show and we'll come up on your giant TV. That, cool. That's rocking. It's a little appalling to see yourself that big. I just got a man up to that, but <laughs> it's cool to see it. So Again, wherever you like to consume your content, we'll be with you. Okay, Muhi, this comes to us from Cheryl from San Francisco, kind of your old stomping grounds. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the question is this, while this may seem like an accounting question, how do we account for bequests or estate gift promises? I have been doing a lot of work on this, and I don't want my development goals to be overlooked at the end of the year. Interesting question. Definitely very interesting. Uh, I believe when I was at the Red Cross, we had a separate planned giving team mm -hmm. uh, and they would count it towards that year's fundraising goals. They would. Uh, so every shop may do it differently. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are feeling like your goals are going to be overlooked, mm -hmm. um, I would still suggest to count it whether you do it as a soft credit for now, hard credit, those are things that you and your team can discuss. Um, but again, when I was at Red Cross, we had a whole separate team. And sometimes there were intermingling of portfolios and credit would have to be transferred to the planned giving team, even if it was somebody who was in your portfolio that you stewarded uh, and those types of things. So um, I would definitely keep doing your homework on it, Cheryl, uh, and see what other organizations do and see what works best for your organization. So, Muhi, let me ask you this in a hypothetical, and maybe this happened to you. You're working with a donor and you've got a great relationship and they're giving and everything's great. And then you meet with them for coffee one day and they're like, oh, hey, by the way, I just met with my trust officer and attorney and I've left you a little something, something. What do you do? Do you, at, at that point, given that you have this other team and like you said, co-mingling information or funds, is it appropriate to push on that or what do you, what do you do? Yeah. And, you know, having a conversation around, you know, are there going to be gifts that are coming in during your lifetime going forward? Or is this a trust where it's, you know, like a, 
remainder trust or an annuity trust uh, and see what the different options are. If the trust is involved, it's most likely going to the plan giving team. Um, but if there are uh, still personal giving in addition to the trust or the will, uh, then it may stay within the portfolio. But again, that's something that a manager would figure out or at Red Cross, the national headquarters would kind of develop the strategy and then allow the chief development officers and uh, regional vice presidents to figure out how to best navigate that for the teams. Because I can imagine if it was like just an off the cuff, by the way, I've, I've left you a little something, something versus I want you to meet with my attorneys or my trust officers. I mean, that's like a completely different strategy and amount of information, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And more than likely it would end up with the plan giving team, especially with the trust being involved, even if they casually mentioned it, uh, then it would be up to that plan giving officer to steward that relationship going forward wow. for that intended plan gift. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, it's, you know, Cheryl, good for you for tr keeping track of this. And I, I like movie's idea of separating it out at, to, at some degree so that um, you can also alert, if you will, your, your team, maybe it sounds like they don't have a planned giving department. Um, and so just to let everybody know if there's a, if there's a place where this information is kept and there should be a place where this information is kept, um, that you can, yeah, that you can, you know, go forward because as we know, Muhi, we talk about this a lot, you know, there's the aging of America. There's so much opportunity for planned giving. And I, you know, I think American donors are looking for this specifically. And so what does that look like and how do we manage it? Yeah. We need to be talking about this. Okay. Now, you know how I feel about name withheld questions. Oh, your favorite. I live or die by them. <laughs> so, okay, this came from uh, Orange County, very, very prosperous part of our country in Southern California. It says, how do you feel about having all members of the development team's goals reported out to the group? We never did this before, but at the first of the year, our DD wants, development director, wants this number to be shared. A few of us are super angry about this and feel it will add to our stress levels. Never had this question before. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, and again, at American Red Cross, there would be a national report that you could see your colleagues from all across the country and what their percentage to goal was. Um, so <laughs> from a corporate standpoint, individual standpoint, they tracked it all and they shared it all. Um, so definitely within the region of like the Pacific coast, we had those numbers across the entire team. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there were ways to see it nationally as well. Um, you know, you have to go and understand why you're feeling super angry and why you feel it will add to your stress levels. Um, yeah. You know, maybe you feel like it's added pressure. Uh, maybe you feel like it's unfair because somebody who may be getting paid more than you is less to their goal than you are, or you've raised wow. more than other people. There's a lot of things at play and could factor into this. Uh, but I think from a development standpoint, at least the directors, at least the senior C-suite level folks should know these numbers. Uh, for frontline fundraisers, if you want to keep that one-on-one, -on -one, I can definitely understand that, but I don't think there's any harm if it's not being used in a negative way. Mm -hmm. I think more information is good information. Yeah. You can work on collaborating with your teammates, um, talk more about what issues they're running into if they're not to their goal uh, or on track to meet their goal. So mm -hmm. a lot of context is needed here. Right. Uh, but I can uh, see where they're coming from. So let me ask you two follow-up questions. Did you ever see this as a gender um, issue, like reporting out? Because it seems to me women are more afraid about talking about money. And um, I'm wondering if that's the case. This literally came into me with um, 
a name withheld. So I don't know the gender. Um, I'm assuming it's a woman just because of the way it was written. And that's just a total assumption. Yeah. Total assumption. But, um, and then, um, so that's one question. And then my next question is, how did you respond to this? Was yeah. it, was it positive? Did it like get you going or, or mm-hmm. how did it work with your mindset? I think, you know, new things can be scary. So on the gender part, I don't know whether, you know, somebody who is male or female feels more inclined to this. I think anxiety and stress affects everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) uh, I would say that I never, and maybe it's just my mindset, but I never thought of it as a fear inducing or stress inducing thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I knew that like year end, December timeframe, I'm going to hit or exceed my goal. And I knew in my portfolio, I had 10 people who were going to get me like 80% to my goal. So I focus on those 10 people. Uh, And if you're focusing on those people that are going to get you the majority of your goal, that's what's important here. Uh, And feel bold enough to push back at the right times uh, with your portfolio and your managers and saying like you're owning this relationship and you're expecting it to come based on the information you've received from the donor. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you haven't heard from the donor, you know, there are things that you need to consider there and what are the factors that are leading to that? And that would cause me more stress. Mm -hmm. Not the fact that my percentage is being written and other people on the team know about it. Right. Thankfully, I have a performance of goal issue, um, you know, and maybe that's to do with the Red Cross being such a well-recognized brand, mm-hmm. um, or it could have been that I was that awesome of a relationship manager. I don't know who's to say. <laughs> well, I think it's an interesting thing, you know, for me uh, to hear you say it's about your mindset and start that start there first and to understand that change is hard and, and, and why are you feeling anxious about this? And then being able to articulate that. I think that's a healthy thing, not just for this question, but probably just a, along the trajectory of one's career. So I think that that was really wise. And um, it, it'll be really interesting to see. Sometimes we get comments back about answers. And so it'll be fascinating to find out if we if we get folks that are, you know, that have an opinion about this. And we welcome that because it's just such an interesting thing to be talking about. And I think as we become more strategic in our nonprofit management, we have more dashboards, we have more technology that we're, you know, engaging in, this is going to be the reality. It's it's going to be, you know, more than just using a spreadsheet, right? <laughs> so I kind of think that's where we are. Okay, well, let's go to, thank you, Muhi. Let's go to Marco in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Marco writes, as we look forward to the next year, how important is it to have our board members um, all re-sign policies? Mm -hmm. We have not had any document or legal changes, but the policies our members signed were dated for the 2023 year. That's an interesting one. You know, if your documents haven't changed, Mm -hmm. like there haven't been any amendments, there haven't been any additional uh things that would differentiate what they had originally signed Mm -hmm. i think it's still binding but i'm not a lawyer Mm -hmm. um and i know for instance like american muslim community foundation at one point had updated our bylaws so we needed new signatures and people to sign on um we have an nda but we do that once they sign on uh and we do like an orientation once they sign on and an annual meeting where we review documents, but we don't have them sign it again. Okay. So the conflict of interest uh, policy as well. So definitely, yeah, we haven't had them re-sign in the new year, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'd be curious as to why Marco feels that way. Yeah, so my sense of it is, number one, always get this done in December so that, starting January 1st, you're good to go. Um, Because a lot of us start, you know, I mean, I I never think of a board that I sat on where it didn't, this stuff didn't get done in January. 
And so by the time it really gets executed and everything, it's February. So back up, do it in December so you get it done in January, no matter what you're doing. My sense of this is, um, and I'd love your opinion on this, Muhi, is that if you do this every year, you have the most updated signature and commitment and level of understanding. And even though it hasn't changed, it's almost like um, a reminder or a reinforcement as to what what's going on. Like that COI, you know, mm -hmm. the NDA, especially when you're talking about funds and, you know, your development issues that can get really personal. And then if you work in an organization that serves children or minors, you have additional things. You have HIPAA laws, depending if you're serving in the medical field. I don't know, Muhi, it just seems to me like they should be reinstituted every year. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any harm to doing it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a lot of work. Right. <laughs> I think if you get it all done at once, you know, and you you do it in that that time frame where everybody knows, maybe, you know, you communicate to your board, okay, remember, we're going to execute these documents, come early, or we're going to put them up on our board portal or whatever. Um, so that you have them. I, I do believe firmly these things must be in place for January 1. I, yeah. I really do. I just think, I think you put too much stress on your team and the compliance issues get haywire if it's not done, you know, in advance. So that's kind of my two cents. Okay, let's go to Richard in Colorado Springs. I bet Richard's getting some snow today. I'm a new CEO and have been thinking about instituting a new program where I do a check-in with each board member monthly. This would be a phone call with the goal of making sure we are encouraging board member engagement. Do you think this is a good idea? You know, I would love to see this happen at so many organizations. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what is the board meetings look like? Are they quarterly? Are they annually? Are they monthly? Um, so bi-monthly, like what is the cadence? Um, and do committees meet more regularly? What uh, right. benefit if you outweigh it? Like what are the updates that you're doing? And it might be, it seems like these would be individually and maybe for the first three to six months, you do this and get a feel for it, uh, mm -hmm. especially as a new CEO, strengthening those ties. Yeah, of course, you want to mm -hmm. be reporting to the board president and other leadership. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a good first step, Richard. Um, do you need to do it ongoing indefinitely? Maybe not. Uh, but again, that depends on the cadence of different meetings and structures that you have in place. Yeah. I think that's wise advice. I think um, I, I like that. I hadn't thought of that, Muhi, about looking at it as, as something that you're doing because you're new or doing it because it's a, a practice that you're sit, situating up uh, for your board. I had a really interesting conversation with a CEO of a very large foundation recently, and he was telling me that he has, when you look at his board, that's not terribly large, but it's it's a good size. Um and plus committee meetings that the board members, committee areas that the board members serve. He has 33 meetings a month wow. just with his board. And I was like, dude, that's too much, you know? And this, I was just astonished by it. Um, and I don't know how you get around that unless, you know, January 1, you institute something new and you're like trying to refine stuff. But it seems to me, Richard, you can go, you know, a couple different ways. I like Mookie's um, advice on this because it's just too much of a time suck if you're, um, if you're not having a meeting where you're refining what it is that this is my opinion, what the how the board member can engage and serve you, right? Mm -hmm. But if it turns into like a kind of a bitch session, um, then I think that's just really negative. I mean, like super negative. So yeah. you know, that would be kind of a hard thing to do. Okay, my friend, are you ready for this wackadoo question that came in this morning? I I've should... been waiting for it ever since you mentioned it. <laughs> I 
<laughs> you shouldn't say wackadoo. That's terrible. Okay, this is a question. As a, it was emailed to me, and uh, now so it I, better be name withheld. <laughs> it, is, it is. Well, I yeah, it because it came from an institution's email. Yeah. No name associated, so they took off their signature line, and I. So anyway, long story short, this is the question. The question is, or was, is and was. Um, can an institution serve as a board member, specifically a trust? This is a legal issue. Um, and and so you know, I I don't feel like I have the right answer, but my first reaction, Muhi, was no because of the fiduciary. Uh, responsibility and, and some of the reporting stuff. Like, so for example, we were just talking about signing a COI, conf conflict yeah. of interest, a HIPAA document, you know, board policy, bylaw, whatever, you know? And so my first reaction is, no, it's not smart. <laughs> and it, it doesn't build accountability. If you want a trust, you can have somebody representing that, you know, Joe yeah. Smith as a member of such and such trust, but I don't think an entity, no, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either, um, but, you know, would the board seat be open to anyone at the institution, only advisors at the institution or trust? Mm -hmm. um, I've seen where organizations do have board seats, but that rotation of the person is right. different annually uh, or by term. Right. Um, so it's an interesting concept. I wonder how it would be executed. Um, and yeah, I'll say it. It's a bit wackadoo. It is. It really is. And, <laughs> I, you know, the thing of it is, Muhi, I believe in like the magic of, you know, looking at somebody in their eyes, you know, that whole mano a mano thing, who's signing on the dotted line, who's the direct leader who can make a decision or, or engage in a decision. And it seems to me it's a little nebulous when you have an organization. Now I've, I've sat on plenty of boards where somebody was representing their company, right? right. And, you know, as a, as a leader, but at the end of the day, they were signing on the dotted line or making the decision, voting, you know, all the things that they needed to do. Sure. Um, and sometimes that would be blurred with the organization that they represented. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it wouldn't be. So it's a really, it was such an interesting question. I mean, truly, I had to read it a couple of times because I was trying to figure out like what the background scenario could have been. And all I could think of is a, it's a funder. Yeah, uh, that would make most sense. Um, and again, like rotating the person on, term by term yeah with the most sense to me mm -hmm. yeah i think you're smart i really really like that well yet again Mui kawaja you have wowed us with your brilliance <laughs> and your measured and steady response i always love your um your comments and your perspective because they're, they're different from from everybody else in so many ways Mui kawaja trainer from fundraising academy also dare I say more interestingly, <laughs> the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation, which if you were on earlier, we were chatting, we're going to have Mui come on. Is it January 8th? I believe so. Okay, good. Um, in early January to talk about his work as a co-founder of a major system in America that promotes philanthropic giving and philanthropic management. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation um, because so many of us work with community foundations, um, large and small, and it's it's just really a, a fun topic, I think, to to get involved with. So thank you, Muhi, for joining us on, I'm on, the, on January 8th. Again, Fundraising Academy, you can check them out, out on, online at fundraising-academy.org, and you can see amazing content that they have and um, a lot going on there. Muhi, are you going to be at Cultivate in May? Definitely. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to be going on at Cultivate? 
Oh, yes. Uh, we have our call for submissions until the end of the year. So if you're interested in presenting, definitely get that in. We have uh, different tracks on uh, trends and technology uh, and various other uh, components that we'd love to hear from you on. Um, and this is year two. You know, we had a very successful uh, Cultivate in 2023 with over 150 people uh, coming and learning and uh, networking together. Uh, and that's what it's about, to give people in the local San Diego area and people who want to travel to San Diego the opportunity to um, learn, have more professional development, refresh, reconnect, and build on what they are doing in their careers. And you sold out last year, right? Yep. So yeah. um, when the ticketing opens up, which will be shortly, um, if you got to jump on it because there's, there's only so much uh, room at the table as we like to say. So yeah, hopefully... our timeline is hopefully February. So okay. I can't give an exact date, but okay. uh, you know, keep your eyes peeled for those cultivated tickets. Awesome. R really exciting. I think we're going to be broadcasting one of the days there um, and cool. Jarrett Ransom will be there. So that'll be amazing. Hey, again, everybody, we are here because we have amazing partners that cultivate us. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these folks join us day in and day out. And they also help share the message that we like to end every show. And especially during the holidays where things get really kind of crazy and stressful. And the message goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. Movie, thank you so much.